Do not forget to subscribe to our Telegram channel for all the updates and materials. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. Before we begin with the discussion, there is an important announcement. Pre Parikshan is already live. And this is the best opportunity to test yourself in real exam like situation and across the competition which extends to the whole country. So do take your test, register yourself on eLearn platform and let us now begin the discussion for today's paper which is about 30th of April 2022. The articles which we have taken for today's discussion are there on your screen and let us now begin the discussion. So the first news which we have taken for today's discussion is a very important one, a step that would trigger language phonocyte. And this editorial has been written by Fazal CK, who is an undersecretary of government of Kerala. So when you look at the heading of this newspaper, it points towards a step. So what is this step? This is not a step in real sense, but a statement given by Union Home Minister, who recently urged the use of Hindi as the lingua franca or a language that is adopted as a common language between speakers whose native languages might be different. So Amit Shah recently urged the use of Hindi as the lingua franca rather than English, and especially in interstate communication. Since interstate communication is a responsibility of Ministry of Home Affairs, and he is the Minister of Home Affairs, his statement matter a lot. And so Mr. Fazal says that this step would trigger language phonocyte. If government takes up this step, it will lead to destruction of a lot of languages and federation of our country. And in past week, a lot of statements given by film stars, given by local politicians, points towards recent debate of one nation and one language. Which means, just like you should have one market for one nation, you should have one language for all official purposes dominating both government as well as non-governmental uses of the language. And so if you look at the UPSC syllabus, under GS paper 1, you have a line in the syllabus which is social empowerment, communalism, regionalism and secularism. Now if you look at regionalism in our country, more often than not, it is bound by the identity of language. And if you look at the GS paper 2 syllabus, it says issues and challenges pertaining to the federal structure of our country. And since the time we gained independence, but even before that, but more so after that, language has acted as one of the main confrontation issues between the center and the states and especially the southern states. So you can see that this problem has both social as well as political connotations. It has social connotations because people are very well bound with their language. They identify themselves as the lingual speakers. When we say that someone is a Tamil or someone is a Bengali or that person is a Punjabi, we are not referring to their caste, we are not referring to their religion, we are not referring to their gender. But what we are referring to is what language they speak and most likely it is going to determine where they are located. And this strong sense of identity bound by language gives rise to nationalism. The best example to show would be the separation of Bangladesh from Pakistan. Erstwhile, West Pakistan started imposing Urdu on Bengali speakers, which is what eventually led to the separation. Then you had almost bifurcation of Sri Lanka, which was of course thwarted and prevented due to strict military action by Colombo, but nonetheless it emerged because of imposition of Singhala language on Tamil speakers. And so in very recent history, you have two such examples what imposition of language can do to integrity of your country. But on the other hand, the supporters of one nation, one language say that in order to maintain integrity and unity of our country, we need one language. And so it calls for an important discussion. So we'll begin the discussion by first understanding the constitutional provision with respect to languages. And then we will look into arguments for and against one nation, one language. So before understanding the arguments for and against behind the declaration of one nation and one language, it is always a good idea to first have a look at what constitution of India says about the languages. And so the provisions related to languages or language are scattered across various articles in the constitution. For example, article 120 or 210 talk about language to be used in parliament and state legislatures respectively and gives the option of transacting business in Hindi as well as in English. So you have the option of both Hindi and English. 
Then under Article 343, the Parliament is empowered to decide by law the languages to be used for official work. Then Article 344 provides for constitution of Parliamentary Committee every 10 years. To recommend to the President regarding progressive use of Hindi language for official purposes of the Union and restrictions on the use of English. So you can see that it is the mandate of the Constitution to ensure that Hindi is being increasingly used and the use of English declines with time and for that purpose the Constitution has empowered the Parliament to form a committee every 10 years. And then apart from this, a very important article is Article number 351 which says that it shall be the duty of the Union to promote the spread of Hindi language, to develop the Hindi language so that it may serve as a medium of expression for all elements of the composite culture of India, and to secure its enrichment by assimilating without interfering with its genius, the forms, style and expressions used in Hindustani and in other languages of India as specified in the 8th schedule. And so 8th schedule, is the last provision of the constitution which deals with the national languages. So all those languages which have been mentioned in the rate schedule are national languages. So from the perspective of prelims examination, this much information is sufficient. But we don't have to limit ourselves to prelims examination. We have to qualify mains as well. And there you need this analysis. And so when it comes to Hindi, out of all the national languages, Hindi gets the most prominence and there is of course some of the valid reasons behind it as well. For example, Hindi is most widely spoken language in the country across various regions and has the potential to become one of the bridge languages. Apart from that, constitution itself mandates that progressively the use of Hindi should be increased across the country. And for a country like India, which has uh, 122 languages and 19,500 dialects, Hindi holds one of the most important position spoken by more than 43 to 44% of our population. And if you compare it with the next most widely spoken language, that is Bengali, which is spoken by 8% of the people. So you can totally understand it has real dominance when it comes to other languages or with respect to other languages. But the matters in polity and governance are not determined on these matters. They are determined on the basis of the vetting of the argument. Argument both for and against to a motion. So whenever we talk about one nation, one language, which basically means that a nation should have one language for all its official and non-official purposes. Of course, people can continue to speak their own mother tongues. That is a different matter altogether. But a country should primarily be recognized and should have one of the languages as its primary language, which is not the case with our country right now. As you all know that we have more than 1300 primary languages. Then we have around 22 national languages. And then we have two official languages when it comes to the central government or the center. Now the proponents of Hindi argue that one nation should have only one official national language. And they argue that it is much needed for an efficient transaction of administration or business in the country. Because they argue that various people work for central government. Central government is the largest employer in our country. And so they always face the language problem when they move to other regions of India and therefore the administrative machinery will not be able to efficiently deliver. If the language becomes a barrier in understanding people's aspiration and need, we need to unify this language. Removal of this language barrier is going to enable rapid development in our country and at the same time it is going to extend India's global reach. It is going to do so because a uniform national language will give us great advantage at global scale due to its large number of users, thus forcing people of other nations to learn our own language. And just like we recognize China as Chinese, Germany as German speaking people, France as French speaking people. And when you want to extend our relation with these countries, you have to learn these languages. But when it comes to India, there is no one language. There's just English. And finally, of course, constitution in various provisions has made sure and hence the constitution makers wanted us to promote Hindi as first among the equals out of all the languages. And so these on the first hand look like a very compelling arguments in favor of having one language for one nation. But there are certain other factors which you should be aware of. 
And these three important concepts are linked between language and identity, linked between language and nationalism and Indian nationalism. So for example, language is intrinsically tied to identity and this often includes the identity of a nation. Thus, there is a close connection, there is a close interconnection between language and identity. You take away language or you force another language on the people, it will lead to either the loss of identity for those people or a strong sense of rebellion from those people. Because of which there is a strong link between language and nationalism. Especially if you look in European countries, all these nations are basically languages. Italian people formed Italy, German people formed Germany, French people from France and English speaking people formed England. And so as and when you tweak with identity, you give rise to nationalism. And especially if the language is forced upon, it is often looked as the entity which is forcing that language, that foreign language or that outside language is often seen as different to the people on which it is being enforced. So for example, what was the main cause because of which you had such a high rate of insurgency in northeastern provinces of Sri Lanka? That was because of imposition of Sinhala language or Sri Lankan language on Tamil speaking North Sri Lankans because of which their identity was felt threatened and hence there was strong sense of nationalism which cropped up in those people because of which they took up arms against the central Sri Lankan government. This is what has happened in Pakistan. When Pakistan started imposing Urdu over East Pakistan or Bangladesh, Bangladesh fought a bitter war and eventually got separated. And third point is the most relevant one in case of Indian scenario or in case of Indian context. It is important to understand that our nationalism, our sense of brotherhood, our sense of commonhood, the feeling which bind all the Indians together is not based on religion, is not based on region and is not based on language. And so to mistake either of these characteristics as a binding threat for Indians would be a big mistake and hence now you will be in a better condition to appreciate the against. And the first argument is that imposing Hindi on non-Hindi states would be against the federal structure of our country because all the states have been given full freedom to adopt any of the national languages as their official language. And to impose Hindi on these states would be direct violation of the constitution. And if it is done without the development of the consensus among the states, it will be outright violation of the constitution. There is a lack of consensus among the population with respect to one language as the whole construct of national language seems more of an imposition of one language lovers over the another language speakers. And as we have discussed, one nation, one language is more of a colonial con construct and it is against the very idea of India. It is the mentality of the European people who themselves were afflicted by one nation, one language. Since they could not get well together with speakers of other language, they started forming an identity and nationalism around language. They thought that people who speak the same language would bind together and would form a nation. And that is where the idea of one nation, one language has come from. And to apply that imported idea into our country would be a mere disastrous. The, and then finally, we have English as a form of blessing in disguise, which has acted as de facto lingua franca in our country. It has not only enabled connection among or between the citizens of our country, but has also enabled India's rapid development across the globe. And that is the primary reason behind Indians taking up the most advantage of globalization in terms of service sector. We could benefit from the service way because we were primarily English speaking when it came to official purpose. So the next news which we have taken appears on page number one, China to ease curbs on entry of Indian students. So China will allow some Indian students to return to resume their studies after a two year pandemic induced gap on a need assessed basis. India accounts for among the highest number of foreign students in China with more than 20,000 enrolled in universities there, mostly in medical colleges. And they had to return back due to COVID-19, but they are not able to return back to China and that created a lot of problems. But apart from that, India and China relations always find themselves in the newspaper every day. 
and this relationship finds its place in the national news and international news always is because of the number of issues which plague india china relations and the more issues you have between the neighbors more news they are going to make despite being two of the largest countries of asia economic power house of the globe sharing a very long border similarly economically situated in terms of global economic order and keeping almost the same view on various of the problems like climate change global warming economic policies india and china are not able to reconcile the differences they are not able to reconcile their differences because these issues are so wide in nature of course it starts with the border dispute then india is troubled because of the ambitions which china has harbored in past 20 years because of which it has constructed a lot of infrastructure in south asian region in indian ocean along its rivers and finally because of the various economic policies followed by china towards india and so when you have such wide ranges of divergences it is very difficult for these countries to get along well and so that is why we are going to discuss the issues between india and china ties so whenever we talk about india's relation with china there are a lot of issues to start with we have india and china border dispute then we have a lot of chinese initiatives and especially belt and road initiative then in past 10 years a river water dispute between india and china is creating a lot of problems in the relationship then increasing presence of china in indian ocean as well as in south asia which is india's immediate neighborhood is creating a lot of problems for our country but issues with china is creating for india is just not limited in geo strategic terms it also extends well into economic terms due to increasing trade imbalance between india and china the high trade deficit which india faces with respect to china is a problem for us and finally perpetual strong support provided by chinese government military to pakistan is a cause of concern for us and so we are going to look into these aspects in this discussion starting with of course with the india china border dispute and so the border dispute exists because india and china border has not been clearly demarcated throughout and there is no mutually agreed line of actual control the lac is the demarcation that separates indian controlled territory from chinese controlled territory india considers the lac to be 3488 km long while the chinese consider it to be around 2000 km long and this differing perception of the border is the root cause of the problem and so let us understand line of actual control in order to gain the full perspective of the problem this line of actual control which is used to refer to the disputed border which we share with china and so when we have discussed line of control which has been delineated on map and have been signed by both the armies but in case of line of actual control it has never been put on map and if you are going through newspapers every day you know that is the actual problem Chinese like claim to a territory which India does not agrees to India sends troop to a region which China says belongs to them and that is happening only because this particular line or a boundary has never been put on map there is no agreement between these two countries as to where the actual control should lie as far as both these nations are concerned and so this particular line of actual control remains ambiguous even as of now If we talk about its segregation it is divided into three sectors eastern middle and western the eastern sector which spans arunachal pradesh and sikkim the middle sector in uttarakhand and himachal pradesh and the western sector of course in ladakh however the line of actual control in ladakh region does not confirms with the political map of our country which you are habitual of seeing it runs something like this with Aksai chain controlled by China although it has never been put on map but there is some kind of agreement to actually decide some of the points and that was done in 1993 through agreement to maintain peace and tranquility through this agreement India and China decided to maintain status quo on their border pending any eventual boundary settlement so boundary settlement has not taken place but until then the status quo will be maintained wherever the person is sitting will keep on sitting but that does not prevents one country from imposing their own perception of line of actual control on the other country and that is the basic reason why we are having so many scuffles between india and china 
But since border dispute between India and China has been ongoing since 60 years, it is not a new thing. Although what has emerged as a major issue between India and Chinese relations are recent factors. For example, Chinese initiatives like Belt and Road Initiative, which is made up of belt of overland routes and maritime road, which aims to connect Asia, Europe and Africa. So you should not get confused. Road is maritime in nature, which will lie over the sea lines of communication, whereas belt lies over terrestrial zone and it will be a zone of economic development, which will start from Asia and from there, it will grow into Europe and Africa. So it's basically reincarnation of ancient maritime Silk Road, which was dominated by China. And it is designed to provide an impetus to trade from China to Europe through South China Sea and Indian Ocean and from China through South China Sea towards South Pacific. Now, this initiative is extremely problematic for India. It's problematic because first and foremost, some of its projects violate India's sovereignty. As it passes through part of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir that belongs to India, and no country can accept a project that ignores its core concerns of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Because once a country joins and accepts a project under Belt and Road Initiative, that country is awarded handsomely in terms of loans. But these countries are very small countries with very small production and foreign exchange. And these projects are not able to convert themselves into a viable economic options because of which these countries are unable to pay back the loans which binds these countries into Chinese debt trap. What has happened in Sri Lanka? Chinese made a port in Sri Lanka, promising that this port is going to overturn economic situation in China, which did not happen. And hence, China was unable to repay the loans given by Chinese because of which Chinese were handed over the position of the port for 99 years and that is how China is increasing its influence in India's neighborhood. There are other issues because of which India is worried. Since a lot of countries are partnered and actively participating in Belt and Road Initiative, this new trade multilateralism is going to shape the global economic rules. Just like in last 50 to 60 years, Bretton Woods institutions have written down the rules of economy or trade. More and more number of countries are on the same platform when it comes to the global trade and they are being guided by China and that is going to create problem for our country. Then the new arena of confrontation has emerged in India-China relation in past four to five years because of the reports that China plans to build major dams across the Brahmaputra river. And this has again created problems between India and China. So China has officially stated that it plans to build run of the river dams on Yarlung Zangbo, which is a major tributary of Brahmaputra river. But at the same time, China has also stated that there is no cause for concern as it plans to keep communication clear with both India and Bangladesh. But when it comes to China, things are not as simple as it is stated by the country. So China has been building these three dams, as you can see on the map as well as on the handwritten text. Jiezu, Zangmu and Jiacha in the upper reaches of Brahmaputra. And India has objected to it, but there has been no formal treaty over sharing of the Brahmaputra water. And that is the cause of concern for India. And it is a cause of concern because in the long term, experts have highlighted that even run of the river projects will significantly reduce the availability of the water in the northeastern region and increase the siltation level. So we can say that it is going to impact both quantity as well as the quality of the water flowing down in India. Then in the long term, these dams can be used as a blackmailing tool by China. Because control over joint water resources is a very important tool for any country. And to cite the best example, China stopped sharing of hydrological data on Brahmaputra during Doklam standoff. But it was sharing the same with Bangladesh. So you can see how water can act as a diplomatic and geostrategic tool when two countries decide to fight war against each other. Not just that, it is going to cause various environmental impacts as well. Because several experts have cited concerns such as increased pollution in the river, potential impact on climate change, threat to biodiversity in the region and altering of monsoon pattern of the region. And apart from this, it is going to increase our vulnerability to the disasters in the region. 
After all, artificially controlling and consequent sudden releases of the flow of the water increases the probability of floods, especially in the lower regions of Assam and Bangladesh. So these are the four reasons because of which India is extremely worried about the new construction of dams in upper reaches of Brahmaputra, but China is doing nothing to address India's concerns. Then moving on from river water disputes, we have increasing influence or presence of China in both Indian Ocean region as well as in South Asia. And this is a topic which you have to understand very clearly. And there are two elements to this. First is increasing influence of China in India's neighborhood in terms of territorial neighborhood. For example, India has agreed with Nepal on trans-Himalayan multidimensional connectivity network which is about cross-border railway network cross-cutting the greater Himalayas, which is massive, which is going to substantially cut down Nepal's dependence on India and hence a key leverage over Nepal will be lost. That is one. When it comes to Bangladesh, China has been aggressively funding projects in Bangladesh. 25 energy projects, China is building and funding the second nuclear power plant of Bangladesh and apart from that, the Bangabandhu 1 satellite which was launched by Bangladesh in 2018 was a result of direct collaboration between Bangladesh and China. Then when we look at Sri Lanka, we already know Hamban Tota port. Apart from that, last year China donated a frigate to Sri Lanka. At the same time, China has funded the procurement plan for Sri Lankan military and most of these procurements are going to come from Chinese defense manufacturing industry. Then. We are going to have a separate discussion on Pakistan and how it is helping China against India. When it comes to Maldives, Maldives economy is increasingly integrated with China. For example, 70% of the debt of Maldives is owed to China. Maldives at the same time has leased out several key and strategically important islands to China. And when it comes to Myanmar, Myanmar has deeply entrenched itself in China by signing comprehensive strategic cooperative agreement. Apart from that, the current ruling dispensation of Myanmar, which is constituted of mainly the military personnel, is heavily bent towards China. So whatever we have discussed so far deals with increasing influence of China in India's immediate neighborhood in terms of territory, territorial or land occupation. But what about increasing influence of China in Indian Ocean? And as you can see on the map, these are the initiatives which are taken by China. Starting with Sonadia port, Kyakyu port, Koko Islands, Kuantan port, Port Kiang, Kuala Lingi International Airport, Port of Tanjung Priok. Then we obviously know Port of Hambantota and East Container Terminal Post. Then when we move to Arabian Sea, we have Marawa Atoll. Then towards Western Indian Ocean along the coast of Africa, you have Port of Dar es Salaam, Jibouti Port. Then in the Middle East and North Africa, you have Port of Dukh, Gwadar Port. So you can see that it seems like China is building projects to engulf India. And that is what is known as String of Pearls Theory construction of a series of infrastructure surrounding India so that to encircle India in times of need, which can be very helpful when China needs to strangle our country. Then a key constraint in the ties between India and China comes from the trade imbalance. The trade imbalance is so immense that India is threatened economically as a result of that. First, let us understand the full spectrum of the India's trade imbalance against China. Chinese import is about 16.6% of all import, but China accounts for about 5.3% of all India's exports. India's trade deficit with China is around 70 to 80 billion dollars. Apart from just the numbers, there are few crucial areas where India is critically dependent on China. For example, pharmaceutical industry. We know that APIs or active pharmaceutical ingredient, which is key for any kind of drug, about two third of that is being imported from China. When we talk about solar panels, there is complete domination of Chinese imports and our national solar mission is completely dependent on imports from China. When it comes to automotive industry, the key components like chips, circuits, all of these are being imported right now from China. So you can see not just in terms of value, but also in terms of quality, we are critically dependent on China. And so 
it obviously begs for a discussion how have we led ourselves into this situation and so first and foremost our liberalized trade regime or fdi regime has allowed the inflow of these products then to start with chinese companies were already very competitive with respect to indian domestic firms and then finally the kind of measures which india has taken in past 5 to 10 years are ineffective so ineffective remedial measures have been insufficient to plug inflow of high amount of chinese products into our country but at the same time the question arises what can we do about the situation can we completely ban the chinese imports in our country and so the obvious answer is no but obvious answer is no because of various reasons first and foremost you have to understand that the products which come from china are ultimately very beneficial for poorest consumers in the country they are extremely cheap although their quality could also be cheap but nonetheless they provide much needed relief to poorest people in our country if all the smartphones are sold for higher than 40000 rupees most of the population will not be able to afford it and so there is a market and a big market in case of our country for mobile phones starting from 4 to 5000 and that is where chinese come into play then if we completely cut off china from our trade it is going to punish indian exporters as more than 50% of india's imports from china are either capital or intermediate goods so when we do value addition just like uh, pharma sector whatever we export is dependent on import from china and even if we boycott china it's not going to impact china in any way because chinese exports to india account for only 3% of the overall exports by chinese so if they are exporting goods of 100 rupees across the globe only 3 of that is coming to our country and so that is why it is not going to impact china in any way so what we can do to help this situation has already been discussed in great detail in another dns as you can see on the screen so please have a look at it if you want to understand the steps taken by our country to counter china and then last but not the least china's perpetual support to pakistan and its agenda apart from its investment in china pakistan economic corridor which we have already discussed china has always been very vocal in support of pakistan when it comes to kashmir issue or terror in pakistan or entry of india into nuclear supplier groups or pakistan stands on united nations security council reforms in all these matters china always sides with pakistan the next article which we have taken up chief justices of hcs urge to send names to fill vacancies so chief justice of india urged the chief justices of high courts to extend their wholehearted cooperation and speed up the process of recommending names to fill up judicial vacancies in their high courts now from the perspective of both prelims as well as means examination appointment the procedure of appointment various cases become very very pertinent now if you look into the syllabus of gs paper 2 structure organization and functioning of executive and judiciary is a part of your syllabus and one of the important ways through which an organization can function efficiently is the way appointments are made and especially in case of judiciary the way people are appointed is crucial for determining the independence of judiciary and so in this regard we are going to understand the constitutional provision the genesis of three judges case which lies in keshwan and bharti case what challenges collegium system faces and what is the way forward let us now begin the discussion now whenever we talk about judicial and higher judicial appointments or appointment to these constitutional posts why are we so worried about these appointments now we are worried about these appointments because the way these judges are appointed decides the independence of the judiciary Now if you've gone through even the most basic of the text of NCERT you know the constitution of India has taken a great care to ensure the independence of judiciary let us know in the comment section what are some of the provisions through which the constitution has ensured the independence of judiciary now why is independence of judiciary so important now independence of judiciary especially in a democracy like India is very very important because first and foremost you need to maintain public confidence in the judiciary that public confidence will come only when judiciary will be and will be seen as independence then if you want to uphold rule of law you have to be independent because more often than not threats to rule of law come from government and then if you want to protect individual rights fundamental rights and liberties which again are generally threatened by the government and its actions 
you will have to be independent an appointment is one of the ways through which either the independence can be gained or it can be lost if we are talking about judiciary because if the appointment procedure is dominated by the government or executive many people say that judiciary higher judiciary will also become like another ministry or an attache of a government and so that is why the first article which deals with judiciary higher judiciary article 124 also talks about the appointment to the higher judiciary in the supreme court so article 124 states that president shall make supreme court judges appointments after consulting the chief justice of india and other supreme court and high court judges as he considers necessary so the appointment shall be made by the president of india but it is mandatory for the president to consult the chief justice of india for appointment as a supreme court judge as well as other supreme court and high court judges as he or she may think fit similarly for the appointment to the high court the appointment is again made by president but in this case the consultation is done or is mandatory as far as chief justice of india is concerned but then you will have governor and chief justice of high court concerned so now you can see that the constitution has clearly given the power to the president as far as appointment is concerned but president has to consult chief justice of india so what does this consultation means and how far the consultation done with the chief justice of india is mandatory for the president or the government is what has led to a lot of legal debate because article 74 says that president of india shall act on aid and advice of council of ministers it will be unconstitutional for the president to not act on aid and advice of council of ministers but article 124 says that the supreme court judges will be appointed by the president after consultation with chief justice of india and so here is what you have the genesis of a problem of appointment to the higher judiciary so now everyone can see that the collegium system through which the higher judiciary is appointed is nowhere mentioned in the constitution of india and so the aspirants especially those who are in their initial phases of preparation are often confused as to where this collegium system has come into play and for that we will have to go into the history a little bit i will just take 3 to 4 minutes to explain that and the genesis of collegium system can be traced back to keshwanand bharti case which was a landmark judgment which was given by a very very narrow margin of 7 is to 6 where the supreme court delivered its historic verdict which established the doctrine of basic structure to the constitution of india which basically means principles and values that cannot be altered by any act of legislature or executive so of course the verdict was not well received by the government of the day headed by indira gandhi which viewed it as curtailing the power of the parliament and the government and so of course there was bound to be a retaliation and so what followed was a series of unprecedented events on april 26 1973 one of the judges who dissented in the keshwanand bharti case justice a n ray the person who was against the basic structure doctrine was promoted to the position of chief justice of india but he was not the senior most judge because so far the tradition was that the senior most judge of the supreme court will automatically become the chief justice of india so his elevation was made possible by superseding three more senior judges all those three judges who were in the favor of basic structure of the constitution this was a blatant attack on judicial independence by the executive and so from there what took off as a legal battle has culminated into three judges case and these three judges cases have subsequently restored the independence of the judiciary as far as appointment process is concerned we will of course reflect upon the demerits of collegium system but let's just quickly go through the three judges cases Before the three judges case in 1974 Shamsher Singh versus State of Punjab Supreme Court held that approval of Chief Justice of India is must in appointing judges of High Court and Supreme Court Then in 1981 first judges case or SP Gupta case Supreme Court ruled that the recommendation made by CJI to the president can be refused for cogent reasons thereby giving greater say to executive So now you can see it's all about the interpretation of the consultation So in 1974 Supreme Court says that consultation means mandatory obligation in 1981 Supreme Court says that consultation is not binding then in 1993 in second judges case 
द सुप्रीम कोर्ट हेल्ड दैट चीफ जस्टिस ऑफ इंडिया ओनली नीड टू कंसल्ट टू सीनियर मोस्ट जजेस ओवर जुडिशियल अपॉइंटमेंट्स एंड ट्रांसफर्स However, an objection raised by executive on appointment collegium may or may not change their recommendation, which is binding on executive. So now you can see that consultation in second judge's case is now starting to mean boundation. Of course, there is a scope of reconsideration, but after reconsidering, if collegium says the same thing, recommends the same name, executive has to follow it. Then in 1998, under third judge's judgment, the Supreme Court ruled that CJI should consult with four senior most Supreme Court judges to form his opinion on judicial appointments and transfers. The recommendation of the Chief Justice of India would be binding on the executive. So the genesis of collegian system can be traced to the second judge's cases, which interpreted the word consultation as concurrence, which was then restated by the third judge's cases. Of course there were some changes which were made in the way the chief justice of india is going to consult the senior most judges but overall it has restored the same thing now this became a big problem for the government and the executive because now they lost almost all the say in the appointment to the higher judiciary and so to undo that they came up with national judicial appointment commission and the constitutional amendment which has again been rejected by the supreme court and so right now the procedure is the same as given in the third judge's case and memorandum of procedure which was signed few years ago so as the things stand today all the appointments to higher judiciary are being done by a collegium of higher judiciary judges and there is a lot of problem in that the problem is just not limited to the constitutionality of the provision but it also deals with merit corruption and nepotism as well constitutionality because when the constituent assembly debates were going on the assembly deliberately rejected the proposal to vest the chief justice with the veto power over appointments and so something which was debated in the constitutional assembly and was rejected how can it later on become the part of our legal system then the next set of problem comes from article 74 as i have alluded initially because article 74 demands the president to act on aid and advice of council of ministers article 124 says that president is going to consult chief justice of india the collegian system demands the concurrence of the president with or without aid and advice of council of ministers and so this goes against the basic structure which is the parliamentary democracy which requires the president to act only and only on aid and advice of council of ministers now council of minister may advise against the consultation of cgi but that doesn't matter and so according to 214th law commission of india collegium is a clear violation of article 74 then comes the issue of undemocratic nature of the collegium system itself because of the way collegium system has operated in past 20 years it has been very very non transparent and closed to outsiders and no system of checks and balances have existed which are an essential part of democracy and especially for appointments to higher judiciary of course since last 2 3 years supreme court has opened up its collegian system a little bit but not to the extent which is expected of an institution of such a high dignity then there have been numerous cases where people with better qualification and better track records have been sidelined to make way for someone less qualified due to seniority and so there is a case of ruling over of merit over seniority then finally you have uncle judges syndrome now these are not my words but used by law commission in its 230th report which said that nepotism corruption and personal patronage is prevalent in functioning of the collegium system recently justice r m lodha made a comment where he said every third high court judge is an uncle it is found that within the high court relatives are practicing law at the same place most of the judges and advocates have blood relation between them and this is a very very serious issue as far as the independence of higher judiciary is concerned but it's not like higher judiciary has not taken any step supreme court has made way for proceedings of collegian system to be kept in public domain and this was very very correct move and very very welcome move it was an obligation and a moral obligation on higher judiciary to do so especially after it struck down the njac judgment it basically became incumbent upon the higher judiciary to do so then of course the proactive disclosure by judiciary is in sync with the right to information act as well now as far as openness as a value as a value of gs paper 4 is concerned 
it not only means openness in the functioning of the executive arm of the state but also in the judicial apparatus including judicial appointments and transfers and finally the right to know of the citizens the step strengthens democratic process and fundamental rights of freedom of speech as the right to know as an inherent part of the constitution which the secretive collegian system directly violates so these are the steps which the judiciary has taken which is very welcome but now what can be the future course of action so the first step would be legalizing the collegium system by the government law commission has already recommended that parliament should pass a law now this law should not be exactly the same as the collegium system being followed it should have an element of transparency but at the same time it should ensure primacy of the judiciary in the judicial appointment then this new system should ensure independence accommodate the federal concept of diversity demonstrate professional competence and integrity it should also have strict criteria for appointment as a judge of higher judiciary eligibility criteria to judge the performance and suitability must be formulated objectively and must be made public so these are some of the recommendations which will go a long way in ensuring that not only the judiciary is independent but also the continuous struggle which is going on between judiciary and executive can be put to an end let us now move on to the next article The next news which we have taken up appears on page number 12 heat waves linked to man made climate change so scientists say carbon emissions must be curbed because apart from various other impacts on environment and climate change global warming is leading to increasing incidence of heat waves now from the perspective of prelims examination it becomes extremely important for us to understand what heat waves are so a heat wave is a period of abnormally high temperatures more than the normal maximum temperature that occurs during the summer season in the northwestern parts of india heat waves typically occur between march and june which is this time of the year and in some rare cases it might extend till july the extreme temperatures and the resultant atmospheric condition adversely affect people living in these regions as they cause physiological stress and sometimes they might also result in death and so what is the criteria for declaration of heat wave an imd has given out two criteria based on departure from normal temperature and based on actual maximum temperature so there will be a heat wave if maximum temperature of a station reaches at least 40 degree or more for plains 30 degree or more for hilly regions so you can see that of course the cut off for the declaration of heat wave is much higher in case of plains as opposed to hilly regions simply because hilly regions are much colder and even a slight increase in the temperature in hilly areas would should count as a probable heat wave so this is the cut off criteria for prelims examination if if an area is observing higher than 40 degrees celsius then imd will be interested to know if there is a declaration needed for heat wave or not if this criteria is being satisfied then imd is going to check two things departure from the normal normal means average temperature over past 50 years there will be a heat wave declaration if departure from normal is between 4.5 degree celsius to 6.4 degree celsius and if the 40 degree celsius cut off has been breached there will be a severe heat wave if departure from normal is more than 6.5 degree celsius based on actual maximum temperature there will be a declaration of heat wave when actual maximum temperature reaches 45 degree celsius and there will be actual severe heat wave declaration when actual maximum temperature reaches 47 degree celsius at the same time you should know that if the above criteria is met at at least two stations in meteorological subdivision for at least two consecutive days then the declaration is made on the second day so whenever we talk about heat waves we are worried about heat wave because of its impact the health impacts of heat waves typically involve dehydration heat cramps heat exhaustion or heat stroke so heat cramps or edema swelling and syncope which means fainting is generally accompanied by fever of around 101 and 102 fahrenheit heat exhaustion results in fatigue weakness dizziness headache nausea vomiting muscle cramps and sweating and heat stroke is when body temperature breaches 40 degrees celsius or 104 fahrenheit and there is a state of delirium seizures or coma and this is potentially fatal situation 
So from the perspective of prelims examination, it is extremely important for us to understand heat wave and the conditions for the declaration of heat wave. Let us now move on to the next news. The next news which we have taken up appears on page number one, core sector growth dips to 4.3% in March. So output from India's eight core sectors grew by 4.3% in March, moderately lower than 6% recorded in February, but still reflecting the second highest growth rate five months over. And so in this regard, it is important for us to understand what core sector actually means. So core sector means those sectors of our economy on which other sectors are dependent. For example, coal production, steel production, electricity generation, petroleum and refinery, crude oil production, natural gas production, cement production, fertilizer production. So for example, agriculture is dependent on fertilizer, construction sector is dependent on cement and steel production and all other sectors of economy are dependent on various sources of power for example electricity and crude oil and coal so you can see that these are named as core because they act as the foundation of our economic growth and so in india there are eight core sectors comprising coal crude oil natural gas petroleum refinery products fertilizers steel cement and electricity so of course these are major and important sectors of our economy and industry, but they are not the industry. And so these eight core sectors constitute 40% of the total IIP or index of industrial production. This index is prepared by the Office of Economic Advisor under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry and is published monthly with the base year of 2011 and 12. It is also used by banks for financing infrastructure projects and the RBI. Among all these eight sectors, highest weightage as you can see of 28% has been given to petroleum refinery and lowest weightage has been given to fertilizer production. At the same time, IIP or index of industrial production is not produced by Ministry of Commerce and Industry but rather it is prepared by National Statistical Office under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation or MOSPI. So from the perspective of prelims examination, this slide is extremely important.